The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to the second in a series of COVID-19 specific webinars hosted by Carolinas AGC. Today we are pleased to have with us again Ashley Cutno. She is a shareholder at the Labor and Employment Law Firm of Ogletree Deacons located in Greenville, South Carolina. Today she will present on and answer questions on the Families First and CARES legislation that has been passed. She is going to give a summary of key employment related benefits from each piece of legislation, an understanding of how each piece works together, and then move on and answer some questions um, that have been previously submitted to her about each piece of legislation. Today's webinar is going to be recorded and will be sent out to all attendees and posted for on-demand viewing. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to add it to the questions panel and we will work to get through all those questions um, within the hour. If we're unable to get to your question within the hour in the webinar, then we will send those questions to Ashley and she will answer them and post them in the Facebook group afterward. With that, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending and thanks, Ashley. We'll let you take it from here. Hi, guys. We're going to talk today about the Family First Act and the CARES Act and its impact on employers. Um, there's no way that we could cover everything that these acts are doing, but we're going to cover the most important pieces to employers and things for y'all to think about as you're trying to decide how you're going to deal with the COVID-19 crisis and your employees. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what has happened um, so that then when we get to the questions, they will make more sense. So first, I want everyone to remember that this is actually, um, we're now at phase three of the federal legislation that has come down. Following the first piece of legislation, what happened was we received DOL guidance that allowed different unemployment agencies to change their unemployment rules. This happened um, on March the 12th, and at that time, states started to change their unemployment rules. I am going to focus on North Carolina and South Carolina today, but if you have operations in different states, please know that every state has done something now to change their rules. So South Carolina and North Carolina were some of the states that made changes, and we're gonna talk about the specifics of those in just a minute. So phase two of the federal response was called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And it did lots of things, but it did three main things involving employers. These three things are only applicable to employers with less than 500 employees. So first, there's a new expanded paid FMLA leave. Second, there's now a new paid sick leave. And third, there are benefits issues and tax credits to help you pay for these new leaves. Um, there was also more incentives to the unemployment agencies to again change their unemployment rules to make unemployment accessible to more people quicker. So one thing I want everyone to remember as we talk about these changes is that they are all in addition to your existing policies and your existing normal leave rules that you have for your company and in other states. They are not a replacement of, they are in addition to. So that includes your regular FMLA. Um, regular FMLA is still there. This is just an additional benefit to those um, who may be on FMLA and may qualify a different group of people. Same thing with your ADA rules, all still there, all still applied just like they did before. 
So now let's talk about what the Family First Coronavirus Act did um, as far as adding and changing. So first of all, the FFCRA is effective as of yesterday, and these rules will run through the end of the year. So there is a sunrise and a sunset to these rules. However, um, you know, these are the dates that you need to worry about. So again, remember the FFCRA applies to private employers with less than 500 employees. If you are close to that number and you do not know how to count to the 500, um, the loose rule of thumb is look at your W-2 employer and then add to that temporary employees, lease employees, and other shared employees. We can help you with that count and or the Department of Labor has actually issued a document on their website that has 30 hot topics and this is one of them that can walk you through that. So what about if you're, instead of worrying how to count the 500, if you're a smaller employer? So if you are under 50 employees, this rule does apply to you. However, there is an exemption, but you have to apply for the exemption with DOL. You are, at, you are potentially going to get the exemption if you're able to show that, that Providing these paid leaves would jeopardize your business's ability to continue, and that is as an ongoing concern. So there is a way to apply for an exception with DOL, and again, there is some new guidance on that on the DOL website if you are under 50. In addition, if you have less than 500 employees, you should already be posting a notice as of yesterday. This link is actually to the DOL website and it gives you the poster. All you gotta do is hit print and put it where all of your other posters are um, for your employment related purposes and you will be covered with the notice requirement. Again, DOL has a great hot topics guide on their website if you want additional information about what DOL is saying in this regard. Just so you know, there are penalties if you don't comply with this law, just like there are for all of the other um, federal laws like this that are out there. So let's talk about the specifics of what the two new leave laws require you to do. So the new expanded FMLA is only for one reason. It only covers employees who have a minor child who cannot go to school or daycare because that school or daycare is closed. It does not cover people who are in that situation but have the ability to telework. So for example, my office is still working on a skeleton crew, so I am sitting in my office with my door closed, not talking to anybody today. My husband is at home with our three children, working full time because he can do his job remotely. He is not covered because he is still working. I know we got one question beforehand about can this be applied intermittently. We don't have any specific guidance on how that works. However, we have been told that it should be applied just like the FMLA is applied. So we believe you can do the intermittent leave for this if that works for you. Because again, it's not a different law, it's just an adder to the existing FMLA law. So follow your normal FMLA rules, but this new situation is now a qualifier for FMLA where it would not have been before. So to qualify, in addition to being in that one scenario, you also have had to have been an employee for at least 30 calendar days. And if you're not currently eligible because you're so new to the job, once you hit the 30 days, then you'll become eligible. So what is the pay requirement? So you pay two thirds of the regular rate of pay up to $200 a day. 
I want you to listen to me when I say this. So hyper-technically, the first two weeks of this leave are unpaid under the FMLA provision, but it will still be picked up by the sick leave provision we're going to talk about in a minute. It's about which bucket you're counting the leave in, but the entire leave is going to be paid. So again, that's at two-thirds the regular rate of pay, capped at $200 a day. So now the emergency sick leave covers all employees. You do not have to have that 30-day eligibility requirement that is removed um, from this part of the equation. So it can be used in these scenarios, which are essentially you are sick with COVID-19 or you are caring with someone who is sick with COVID-19 and or they have the symptoms of COVID-19, even though they actually haven't been diagnosed yet. So essentially, you're not going to let them come to work because you think they're sick with COVID-19 and they're just waiting on their test to come back. If you'll notice the piece in green, this is what I was talking about with the extended family leave pay. This sick leave also covers caring for a son or daughter whose school has been closed. So again, you get the pay for the full FMLA period, but it's about which bucket it's in. And essentially what this is saying is the person doesn't get the extended FMLA and then the two weeks of sick time on top of it to extend them out to 14 weeks. It's just about how you count it, um, but it is the pay period. So here's how the extended pay sick leave works. If you are the person who is sick, you get your full pay up to $511 a day or $5,110 in the aggregate because this lasts for 10 working days. But if you are on this leave because you are caring for someone else, not sick yourself, caring for them, then it's back at the new FMLA rate which is two-thirds the regular rate of pay, capped at $200 a day for a $2,000 aggregate. So how are you going to pay for this? So we've got a couple of ways that you can pay for it. So first, there are tax credits that can be applied. So the next time you go to pay your payroll taxes, you don't pay them, you don't pay your taxes on these people, and you get the credit back. Your accountants can help you work through that. It also includes any amount that you're paying to keep people on health insurance. So they built in a tax credit in this portion. In addition, the Families First um, Act created a small business loan that can be used for any purpose if you want to apply for that small business loan and our local banks can help you with that small business loan. It's just a general small business loan that they opened up. Now, when we get to the CARES Act, this is the big daddy that they passed last Friday. It is essentially a tidal wave of money into the economy and covers a bazillion different things, but we're gonna talk about just a couple of them today. So first, we have the Payroll Protection Act loan. This is a different small business loan than the one I just mentioned. Again, the Payroll Protection Loan only applies to those of you with 500 employees or less. The purpose of the small business loan is to help provide cash flow assistance as soon as possible. You are eligible for two and a half times your monthly payroll up to $10 million. The portion of the money that you actually use for payroll expenses, that's your payroll, that's leave, that's health insurance, it also includes rent, it includes mortgage insurance, it includes utilities. 
that bucket of money that you use for those things will be forgiven for up to eight weeks as long as you keep the same payroll numbers and number of employees intact. If you get this loan and your payroll numbers or your numbers of employees fall below 25%, there's going to be a reduction in the offset and the forgiveness piece. It won't be eradicated, but there will be an offset. Now, one question that we've repeatedly had is what happens if I fire Ashley or have to lay off Ashley and then I can't get Ashley to come back? It is not, you don't identify the people, your employees when you get this loan, you're doing it at a bigger level than that. It's about number of employees and your max payroll amount that you're getting the loan for. Your local banks can help you with this application and talk you through um, the loan and what it includes and what it does not include. I would encourage you to have that conversation sooner rather than later. It is a somewhat more complicated package only because you have to pull information you normally don't pull about this payroll. You also have to make sure you're tracking your spending so that you can show what it was for on the back end to make sure you can get this forgiveness. Banks are able to start submitting loan packages tomorrow. I am sure there's going to be a flood of submissions and so the quicker you can get in line, the quicker they're going to be able to process your loan package. Now, they did not forget people in companies that have more than 500 employees. There is yet another loan that is available for employees for 500 to 10,000 employees. It does not have the same protection, payroll protection and forgiveness portions, but it does have low interest loan options but there are some significant strings attached that you should know about. For this loan, there are union neutrality provisions that come with this about the employer staying neutral as to unions while the loan is outstanding and in some cases for up to two years afterwards. That same union neutrality piece does not apply to the payroll protection. If you wanna learn some more about that, I know you're all familiar with the Ogletree coronavirus webpage where we have a ton of information. We have a blog post out that can give you all the details about this union neutrality piece if that is something you're concerned about. Um, and again, for this group of employers, there are other options for loans outside of the CARES Act that you might want to consider if union neutrality is something that you are concerned about. And again, you know, I think we don't have a lot of that in the South, but if you're not always in the South, or if you're in an industry where you're working where this has been a concern for you in the past, this is a, this is a big string. And you need to really weigh this string when you're deciding where to get your loan from. So again, you cannot get the Payroll Production Act loan and the first loan and use it for the same reason. In addition, you don't get the Payroll Protection Act loan and use those tax credits from the Family First Act because they don't want to give you tax credits on money that's already going to be forgiven for you. So there's no double dip and your accountants are going to just have to help you get that right as you're filing and doing taxes. And I would encourage you, if you don't have someone helping you normally, this is pretty complicated stuff that you want to get right so you don't mess up any of the forgivenesses or you don't end up not being um, fully eligible for all of the tax credits. So now let's talk about yet another tax credit. Same comment, can't double dip in it, but if you're able to keep employees on the roll and employed, there's a refundable tax payroll credit for 50% of wages. So again, if you're able to keep people in the roles, there's some tax incentive to doing that. Now we're gonna talk in a minute about unemployment. And I think what everybody needs to remember is what you need to do is to some extent, this is a business problem. It is a continuation of services problem. And it's a math problem. You've got to weigh the cost of keeping employees versus the benefit of all of these credits. And that's 
that is a math problem you need to sit down with your accountant and really work through as you're deciding what you're going to do. In addition, there's a payroll tax delay. If you have less than 500 employees, it has a multi-year catch-up, so your taxes, half of them will be due by the end of the year, and then there's a multi-year provision catch-up, which again, your accountants can help you work through, but there are payroll tax delay options that are out there and available for you to help, again, pay for some of these costs. All right, so now we're going to talk about what is kind of one of the big daddies that the CARES Act did. It has changed um, unemployment by expanding it, and we're going to talk through these slowly so you understand them. So first, it does help nonprofits and government agencies because unemployment didn't always cover those folks and now they're going to be covered and given assistance. The other thing it did is there is now a waiver of the waiting week if states want to sign on. North Carolina and South Carolina have both already waived their waiting weeks. Um, so has Virginia, so has Georgia, so has Tennessee. All of the states in our area have already waived the waiting week. But if you have true multi-state operations, um, the states that have not done it yet are in process to make that legislative change. Why do you care? Well, that means if you have to lay someone off, they are immediately eligible for benefits, where before you literally had to wait a week before you were eligible to apply. That's no longer the case. One of the reasons states did not waive it before, it was an issue of how they were going to pay for it, because that week was not something that employers had been paying into the system for. And now the federal government is basically going to pay the state enough money to cover that week for everyone. The other big change that happened is there is now an increase of $600 per week on top of whatever the state unemployment is for 16 weeks and or until July 31st, whichever comes first. There is also a new pandemic unemployment insurance program that is separate and apart from the state unemployment program. It will still be administered by each state, but it is a new plan to cover those folks who are otherwise not covered by unemployment. So your business owners. So some of you may not have been paying into the state system on behalf of yourself because you're a business owner. If you fall into that bucket, this is, a, this is a new plan that will cover you. It covers your independent contractors. It covers your gig workers. It covers your self-employed folks who before were not being paid into the system. In addition, it covers all people who were in the state system after their state system runs out. So every state allows for a certain number of weeks of unemployment. This is going to add 13 weeks on top of whatever the state previously allowed. So again, when you look at the new folks that are going to be covered, it's independent contractors, business owners, and the way it's going to work is that they're going to have to apply with their state agencies, and then the state agencies will process it. It is going to cover anyone who's diagnosed with COVID-19, has symptoms, is providing care to someone. It covers anyone, I actually just had this call five minutes ago, they were getting ready to hire somebody, they were supposed to start next week, and now they need to pull that offer back. That person would be included now because they were scheduled to commence employment and now they cannot do so. It is not available for folks who are again able to telework or if they're receiving some kind of sick leave 
or any other kind of paid leave benefit while that paid leave is being offered. So again, we have an expansion of unemployment of 13 weeks on the back end for up to 39 total weeks. Again, we have an additional $600 per week for up to 16 weeks or until July 31st, whichever comes first. And this is an exponential increase in the amount of unemployment assistance that an individual can receive for the 16 week period. So I know this is a lot, so now we're gonna dive into some of our frequently asked questions. And at the end, I'm going to answer a few more that are coming in through um, the webinar platform. So when will the additional benefits be available? So the way it worked is that every state has to sign on into an agreement with the Department of Labor. As of yesterday at two o'clock, every state has now signed on to receive this benefit. South Carolina does not yet have any comments up on their website about how they're going to implement the process, we expect them to have some up soon. DOL, I mean, North Carolina doesn't have a lot of specifics, but they do have some comments up. The main one being that North Carolina has confirmed that the $600 is going to be applied from this week that we're sitting in here now forward through July 31st. So the extra $600 will be retroactive to this week. So if you have someone who's going to file this week, they will get the extra $600. Now, they might not get it in their first check because North Carolina has to actually get the money, and they think that's going to take about three weeks, but they're going to, they will get a retroactive shore up when they get the money. Um, South Carolina is running on about the same timeline for expected payment but they haven't actually said that anywhere, but we've been talking to them and they think they're on about the same timeline. So South Carolina has also, oh, my arrow, my arrow was messed up there. Um, South Carolina has also made a couple of additional changes that, that North Carolina has not made. So quarterly unemployment payments can be delayed in South Carolina. What you would have paid on April 30th is now due on June 1st but you do still have to submit your wage report filing that you would have done on April 30th. Um, in addition, in neither North Carolina or South Carolina, are they going, they're not gonna charge contributory employer accounts. They may still charge reimbursable employer accounts. We think they're gonna change that rule because of some language in the CARES Act, but again, we're just waiting on them to confirm that for us once they issue their, their detailed CARES guidance. All right, so there are great frequently asked questions on the South Carolina website about who is eligible. North Carolina also has frequently asked questions. If you're in North Carolina, you need to dig around a little harder in North Carolina, some of them are on the employee tab to explain their benefits, and some of them are on the employer tab to, ex to explain their benefits. Um, but in South Carolina, they're all in one place, but they're all on there with some pretty easy explanation on the unemployment website of both states. So again, let's look at it. So how long is unemployment gonna last? So in South Carolina, unemployment is capped at 20 weeks. So you're gonna get 20 plus the additional 13 weeks for 33 weeks. In North Carolina, there's a current cap of 12 weeks for unemployment. North Carolina does have the ability to extend the benefit time period. They have not done so yet, but we're not 12 weeks out from the crisis yet it is fully anticipated that they're gonna extend past this 12 weeks. Um, they just haven't done it, done it yet. So if you see that on the website, don't panic, probably going to be extended. 
All right, so tell me again how this money is gonna work. So in South Carolina, the average unemployment is 236 per week. The maximum you can get in South Carolina is $326. So the example in South Carolina, assuming I were to get my maximum benefit, and remember, unemployment does an individual calculation for each person based on how much wages they make. Assuming you get max benefit in South Carolina, I'm gonna get my state $326, plus $600, so I'm gonna get 926 per week for 16 weeks or until July 31st. After that 16 weeks is over, I'm gonna go back to the 326 rate for the remainder of the 33 weeks because that's all I get in South Carolina. North Carolina is gonna work the exact same way in North Carolina, y'all's maximum is 350, but again, that's your max, not your guarantee. But this formula is going to work the same way. Does that mean it's possible for an employee to receive more money on unemployment than if they're working? Yes. Yes, Congress knew what they were doing when they put this provision in place. Um, the two South Carolina senators, Graham and Scott, actually tried to get this changed, and they were unable to pass an amendment that would have capped unemployment at your last rate of pay. So they knew what they were doing. And what it basically means is if you are eligible to receive even $1 in unemployment under your state system, you receive $601. Next question that I know all of you are asking. If they can earn more money at home, how am I going to keep them working? It is important to again remember that this is on top of the regular unemployment system. If you have someone who just quits to go home, they are choosing to be unemployed. It is not that they are unemployed because they don't have a job. So when the unemployment agencies contact you, you contest the unemployment, just like you would have before. It will then be up to the employee, not you, the employee to prove that they had a good faith basis and a good reason to quit. The only real good faith reason to quit that we know of right now without the regulations is if they're scared to come to work because of a fear of getting the coronavirus. Now, it has to be a reasonable good faith belief that they may be exposed, and that means that A, they fall into a risk category, so they're older, over 65, they have an underlying condition, or potentially they have someone in their home who falls into those categories. Um, you have um, a hot spot at work and you don't close down your job site and do the required cleanings and suggested actions by the CDC such that they have a reasonable argument that it's not safe to be there. Otherwise, it's not a good reason to quit. And I can make more on unemployment than I can working is not a good reason to quit. I will tell y'all um, that the South Carolina Unemployment Agency has actually reached out and wants to make employers aware that there is actually an offer of work form on their website that you can fill out if you have work available and someone doesn't take it. In South Carolina, you get to that through the employer self-service portal. They really want to not encourage people to be, <coughs> excuse me, on unemployment. They want to encourage people to be working. So there is a form for this. Um, North Carolina has a similar process, and there's a fraud line um, that you can use in North Carolina, and most states have something like this 
to be able to show that you do have work for an employee and they're choosing not to do it. So another question we get, well, what if I don't lay people off? What if I reduce their hours? Then what happens to their unemployment? So in all of the states everywhere, you can get unemployment if your hours are reduced, but there's a cap on how much you can make and still get unemployment. And each state calculates it differently. So here's the example that Do gives in South Carolina. And so in South Carolina, a claimant can receive a fourth of their weekly benefit before their weekly benefit is, a, is reduced, and then it's reduced dollar by dollar. But in no case can a recipient of unemployment make more at their job than they would receive in unemployment. So if I'm going to get $300 in weekly benefit in South Carolina, I will still get unemployment until I reach a certain threshold and then I'm no longer eligible for unemployment anymore because I make more money than the state would have given me. That means when we're talking about the extra $600, if I am example one or example two, I will get the additional $600 on top of my benefit. In example three, I'm not eligible for unemployment, so I am not eligible for the $600. North Carolina has a similar reduction calculation, a little different, but similar. And this is what North Carolina looks like. All of the calculations are on the website, um, and you can look at them in the different states. They're all different. I do want to caution you, though, your job as an employer absolutely should not be to tell someone if they're going to get unemployment, if they're qualified for unemployment, what their unemployment amount is going to be. Not your job. You have to give them notice that unemployment exists and tell them how to apply, but that is it. Where these calculations come into play, as I've been talking to employers recently, has been when they're trying to figure out if they should lay off people, how is it going to impact their employees, are they going to be okay versus keeping them on. And so it's that kind of analysis that employers are doing. But you should not be giving advice to your people about what their unemployment is going to look like. That is fraught with danger and is outside of your lane. So there is also a program called um, short time compensation or work share. The CARES Act has provided money for states who do not have these programs to get these programs. Neither South Carolina nor North Carolina currently has one of these programs. The states in red are the states that do currently have a program. But again, we may see more states coming online now that they have the ability to have this kind of program receive some funding for them to run it. What it does is it allows you to have people on reduced hours and still qualify for the unemployment coverage on the piece that they are not working in a scenario that's more beneficial to the employee than if you don't have this kind of program. So if you have people you're reducing hours in the state in red and you're going to reduce hours, good to look at this program. North Carolina, South Carolina, keep your ears open. It may be coming. Can I supplement employee wages while they're on unemployment? So first of all, remember, now they're going to get the additional $600. But there are some employers out there who really want to shore up their employees so they're not impacted by this. If they're making more than a certain amount of money, they will not be shored up if they go on unemployment. In both South Carolina and North Carolina, if you are paying out vacation pay, PTO pay, if you give somebody a severance bonus or a any kind of additional funds, they're not going to be eligible in the week that those funds are paid. It's going to be an offset, and they're not going to be eligible in that week. 
but they will be eligible in a future week. So things you need to consider if you're going to be laying folks off. So you need to be thinking about wage and hour issues, especially if you go to a reduced hour schedule. Remember, for your hourly folks, you pay them for what they work. But for your salary folks, it is if they do work in a week, you're paying them for the whole week, just like always. So be careful when you're reducing hours. For many exempt employees, you don't want to reduce hours. You want to reduce salary. And that requires notice in South Carolina of seven days. And um, you should give notice in North Carolina also. In addition, if you decide to do a furlough down to zero hours, or if you reduce hours for people, you need to be looking at your health insurance plan to see if they're able to continue with health insurance or if it's a COBRA triggering event, regardless of what you call it. So also you may have a WARN event, that's when you have a large layoff and you're an employer over 100 people. You may have a WARN event where you have to give certain notices to employees. There are states that also have many WARN for smaller numbers. Um, North Carolina and South Carolina don't have it, but other states do. Again, state notice, if you're going to do a change in pay rate for an exempt employee or schedules, you need to give proper notice. There are some states, not here and not in the southeast, that have predictive scheduling rules, but if you start getting into the northeast, there are some places where you can't change someone's schedule without some real advanced leave. I mean, advanced notice, I'm sorry. And then when we're talking about, do I have to pay out PTO or leave pay? Um, there are a couple of states that require it. Um, most states do not, and it's an issue of your policy and what your normal payout is on termination. Now, that is true for a layoff. It may or may not be true if you're furloughing down to zero hours for a limited amount of time. Um, it depends on how long the furlough is going to last as to whether or not you have to pay out those benefits. However, if you don't pay out those benefits because you put people out thinking it's going to be short term and then it turns into a permanent termination, you will have to pay out those benefits at that time if that's what your policy says you do at termination. So again, you have to give your employees notice about unemployment. Um, there, in most states, it's just a link to the website. North Carolina and South Carolina, you can just do a link to the website, but they actually do have documents that you can actually attach to those letters that just tell employees that unemployment exists and here's where you go to apply. Um, that's what it is. Now, one other big thing that we have is in Georgia, and this is just in Georgia, if you have a partial layoff, so a partial layoff from a, from a job, not everyone but some people, or if you're reducing hours. In Georgia, they are mandating that the employer file unemployment on behalf of the employees. There is a form on the Georgia website that you have to go and fill out for your employees to help expedite the unemployment claims process. In both North Carolina and South Carolina, um, they have asked you to do this. They're not requiring you to do it, but they have asked you to do it or consider it. Here is why. So what it does is it eliminates a step for the unemployment agency. It eliminates some headaches for you and it gets your folks paid faster. So normally someone files for unemployment, then the state agency has to confirm that unemployment and their wages with the employer, and then the person gets their check. This takes out that confirmation step. So when you file, you're already submitting their name, their, you know, their wage amount, and all of that information that they need. And then when the employer gives the employee gives their information, that whole middle step is eliminated and they're able to get the payment much quicker. Here's how you get to that on the South Carolina tab. 
Um, it is on the employer's bridge to benefit. Um, you should tell your employees if you're going to do this so that they're not surprised by the process. But there are clear instructions on the South Carolina uh, unemployment page. Again, North Carolina has the same thing um, that's out there and available. And so in North Carolina, you can file if the temporary worker has worked less than 60% of their customary scheduled full-time hours or if they're um, laid off permanently. So that gives you the North Carolina link for how to file on behalf of your employees in North Carolina also. So again, what they have been telling us is in North Carolina, they're running at about 14 days to pay benefits from when someone applies, that's their average. Um, South Carolina is actually beating North Carolina at the moment. South Carolina's average is seven to 10 days. Um, that is primarily due to the fact that South Carolina updated their unemployment computer system last year. And so we just have fancier computers down there, which I think at the moment was an um, unanticipated godsend for impacted individuals in this scenario. Um, in South Carolina, they actually have given some guidance that if you file on behalf of your employees, they will become eligible and able to start having a check cut within two to three business days if they've decided to go the debit card or the direct deposit route for payment. So now we're going to go to some questions. And I've already got a few who are here. So I've got one is they're wondering if you're currently offering vacation or sick leave. Um, and then you have to close your doors. Could you allow someone to go into a negative balance such that they will be paid? So I'm assuming that your that answer is yes. Um, you can do that if you want to, to go into a negative balance. Um, if your doors truly close and you're truly out of business, then you're also not responsible for that other leave because you're not you're not operational anymore. So then you're going into a layoff situation. And so the unemployment will apply. And so I think you need to do a math equation as to how much do your people make and do you need to give them this benefit when you have the additional $600 on top through July. Another question is how do we recover our money if we pay an employee to be out of work for, for this period of time? So again, if it's one of the FMLA or six leave reasons that you're out of work, then you use either the tax credit or you can apply for the payroll protection loan to help you cover that. Here's another question. We have an employee who wants to work but is having child care issues. She's currently missing one to two days each week. Do we no use the normal FMLA intermittent leave process? That answer is yes. Again, this is just in addition to the normal FMLA process. So you should um, follow the same process that you would have before. Lastly, this is one about the union neutrality provisions. Um, it looks like there was some confusion on the Facebook page that union neutrality does not apply to the payroll protection loan. It only applies to those loans that are for mid-sized to large employers and it's only applicable to those loans that you get through the CARES Act. It would not be applicable to a different type of loan um, if you just got a different kind of loan from your bank. It's only for those questions. All right, other questions. Will, when will employers in North Carolina be able to file attached claims for COVID-19? So North Carolina issued some guidance today that you should go ahead and start filing. And again, it looks like it's going to be um, two or three weeks before the money is available, but you might as well get in the system and start filing now. And North Carolina's got some new information up about that. All right, we have a few more questions, a few, a little bit more time for additional questions. Um, to our AGC organizers, I'm not seeing an additional question on my sheet, but if y'all have one, feel free to ask it to me.
Yes, uh, we actually have a good bit, so we'll try to get through as many as possible. Oh. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the earliest questions first, and my apologies to everybody if you have answered these questions, um, but I'll just start from the beginning. Um, the first question is, is more of a general question about how self-quarantining, um, if an employee that has been exposed to COVID-19 has been sent home, to self-quarantine for 14 days, are other family members required to self-quarantine as well? So that answer, it, it depends, assuming they all live together, that answer is yes. And I will tell you, I've just put up the, the some additional resources. If you go to the Ogletree coronavirus page, there is a frequently asked questions document that is constantly being updated and it will give you some detailed guidance on what to do in that situation and what you should do for your bigger job site with references to what CDC is telling you to do. Okay, um, the second question is about um, daycare and childcare. Um, hopefully this will uh, be clear to you, Ashley. Does this apply if the daycare or childcare provider is open but the employee just wants to stay home with the child, also, does it matter if child care provider is unpaid child care person or a family member? If their child care is open, then they're not going to be covered by the leave um, because they're making a choice. This is for if your school is closed and that language is included. I have not gotten the question before about if you have unpaid like your grandmother normally keeps them and now your grandmother won't go out because she is concerned about her risk factors. Um, I would need to look into that, but my assumption is that that answer is going to be yes because your your child care is no longer available to you due to COVID-19. Okay, I'm gonna continue down the line. Um, if the business is classified as essential, and we're still conducting business at construction sites. We understand that item one, subject to stay home ordinance, would not allow coverage for that EE to stay home. Did I ask that right, James? That's, yeah, that's correct because you're not you're not covered by the quarantine order. You have an exception to the quarantine order or the stay home order. <clears throat> All right. Um, the next one um, from Ashley is, if an employee is sick with COVID-like symptoms, but the doctor does not test the employee, but will if he continues to have a fever for a few days, is the individual eligible, eligible for paid sick leave? So, so that answer in this, in this situation is going to be yes. Now, if they ultimately test positive for just the flu, then you would stop. Because remember, it's just for COVID-19. But I think right now the way it's working is there's an assumption you have COVID-19 until unless something tells you you don't. They can't test everybody, and the tests are taking up to 10 days to come in. Got it. Um, okay, the next question from Carl was, has caring for been defined? Does the recipient have to require 24 seven care? Uh, so here's my answer to all of these questions. None of this has been defined. Um, we have a bill with no guidance and no interpretation. We're hoping we're gonna get some more interpretation shortly. You do not have to require 24 care, but if you require assistance, then, you, if you, then you're covered. All right, um, the next question. And is, here's the thing, under that, when, when you look at that sick leave law, so if you've got somebody in your house or you've got somebody at home, caring for at home, like a child, is defined as a minor child. So if you've got anybody with school-aged children, they qualify, you don't get to say, oh, your kid's you know, 13, they can stay home by themselves. It, it covers minor children. And again, the sick leave covers if you've got somebody else sick in your household that you have to care for. And you know, it's not 24 hour care, but if you've got somebody sick in your household, you don't want that person at work anyway. Gotcha. Um, let's see, is, is this taxable income for both? In other words, 
Can we take taxes and benefits out of these payments? You do it just like you do all of your other sick and paid leave. Okay, um, how long will uh, measure of EE levels go on beyond eight weeks? Will they keep measuring until end of the year? I, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll come back to it. Um, Let's see, does PPP have limitations on distributions to owners? And we are an S Corp and we need to cover taxes. Yes, there are limitations and for both of those, the limitations for, there's a limitation for how much you can um, pay out to an individual in payroll and there's some S Corp rules. Um, your bank can help walk you through those in more detail when you get the application and or talk to your accountant. All right. But yes, yeah, um, got to thank you. Um, is the employee retention credit for employers under 500 only? No, it's for everybody. All right. Um, I'm going to try to get to a few more from different people. Um, and then, like I said, we will um, send these to you, Ashley, and you can post. Um, what has not already been answered on the Facebook page later. Um, I have I, beg your <laughs> I know. Um, I had 600 employees and now I'm below 500 due to layoffs. Where does my company fit in? Um, look at the DOL guidance. There's some specific guidance about that, but part of it depends on who you're applying for the loan for. If your plan is to call those people back off of unemployment and put them back to work, that's going to cause complications for you. If you're, if it's a permanent layoff, you may fall under the 500, but there's some DOL guidance on those hot topics on that. But you need to be careful. Okay, here's a good one um, from Christina. What changed with 401k hardship withdrawals due to CARES Act? Anything? Yes, so um, there are changes to the 401k hardship withdrawals, and there are also changes to the kinds of loans that are available out of your 401k. The hardship withdrawals, you're going to not be penalized for the hardship withdrawals because they're not really a hardship withdrawal. It's just that you're able to withdraw up to $100,000 early. I think it's $100,000. You're able to withdraw now, and the big piece is you're able to pay it back into the plan without penalty where you couldn't do that before. So your 401k processor should be able to give you some information about that. In addition, now you can take um, a higher amount of loan from your 401k than you could before. Okay. Um, we had an, we had an, to ask an associate that went to New York City to stay away for 14 days as required by the CDC. We think that he applied for unemployment and, expect him, and expected him back today, but he did not come back. What would you recommend we do? Um, so when you get the unemployment, I would contest it. If he, if he doesn't come back and he's not telling you he's not coming back, then you can test it, but it, he'll still get some unemployment coverage, depending on what state he's in, for that period he was out, but he's not going to get it for now, like going forward. In South Carolina, he's not going to be covered. In North Carolina, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm not, I just can't recall what North Carolina's rule is off the top of my head. In South Carolina, if you're sick, you're not eligible for unemployment because you're not able to go get another job. And one thing for y'all to note, so let's assume um, you've got somebody like this new hire person that you never paid into the system for. And so now they're eligible for the brand new unemployment insurance program. Employers aren't paying into that. That's being funded by the federal government. 
Okay, everybody. So um, we reached one hour. Um, we are going to send out the recording of the webinar and also the slides that, that went with it. Um, any of the questions that we have not answered um, will be sent to Ashley and um, we'll give her a little bit of time to get those answers posted in the Facebook forum. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And Ashley, we really appreciate your help today again. Absolutely. And I'll just say as my last point, um, it, it Ogletree, this website I've got up, our resource center, we are posting two and three blogs a day as updates come out and to try and explain this to people. There's a great blog out on the Family First Act. Another one is coming out either this afternoon or tomorrow because of the DOL hotspots that they just came out yesterday. Um, so we're going to be updating some of that information for you. So it really is a good resource to kind of continue to go back and check into if you've got questions because we're trying our best to answer those in that kind of public forum for people and everything on it is 100% is free and, and accessible to anybody who wants to go get it. All right. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good day. All right. Thank y'all.